Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Oh, what has filled my being? Alas, I swell, I change. For the better or for worse, the injury, tis injury to my being. Alas, this is the plea or this is the lament of a cell when it goes into intracellular accumulations. We will look at intracellular accumulations today. And we would be looking at what is intracellular accumulations, a little bit on hydropic change, fatty change, pigment accumulation and calcification. So, at the end of this session, I hope that you know and I hope that you understand these intracellular accumulations. What are accumulations? They occur with metabolic derangements or cell injury and they can lead to abnormal accumulations in the cells. So, these accumulations can be of various forms from substances that are in the cell itself, substances which have accumulated from outside the cell or some other proteins. So, whatever it is, we will look at it in detail. So, they are the result of cell injury or metabolic derangements. Now, the types of accumulations. Normal cellular constituents can accumulate in the cell and we are talking mainly of intracellular accumulations that is they are occurring inside the cell. Water, lipids or fat, proteins, carbohydrates like glycogen all of them can accumulate inside the cells. So, they are all normal constituents. Then there is a big number of abnormal substances that can accumulate in the cell. They can be exogenous that means they have come from outside and they are accumulating in the cell like minerals or products of bacterial or other infectious agents or they can be endogenous that is they are pigments like lipofusin, hemosiderin or melanin or maybe calcium causing calcifications. Now, we will look at the accumulation of normal constituents. Of this, the two that you have to know is basically hydropic change or hydropic swelling and fatty change. Both of these are the result of cell injury and both of them cause reversible cell injury. Again, looking at the flowchart of how cell injury and adaptation can occur in a normal cell, we find that in cell injury if there is a reversible injury, adaptations or accumulations can occur in the form of hydropic change or fatty change and if the cell injury is irreversible, it goes on to cell death. Looking at each of this, hydropic change, the word hydro means water. So, here the other terms that we use for hydropic change are cloudy swelling or vacuolar degeneration. Here what happens? The change is that the cells in the cells the cytoplasm becomes pale and swollen due to the accumulation of water or fluid. So, fluid or water accumulates inside the cells. So, that is hydropic change and why does it happen? It occurs due to disturbances in the ion and the fluid homeostasis or in the pumps in the cell membrane. So, when we talk of hydropic change, the plasma membrane is definitely damaged and then there is diminished DNA ATP formation and also there is diminished sodium pump. So, all these would be defective and as a result of which the 
water accumulates and there is swelling of the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. The main causes for hydropic change are hypoxia and chemical poisoning. Where are the sites where we can get hydropic change? The common sites are the kidney and the liver and as we looked at the definition itself, what happens when there is cloudy swelling? The organ, the kidney or the liver becomes swollen and pale and microscopically we will see clear vacuoles in the cytoplasm and also eosinophilic staining of the cells and this eosinophilic staining is seen more with more severe damage or injury. For example, if you look at the kidney tubules, you see cloudy swelling in the kidney tubules and there you can very well appreciate the eosinophilic staining of the tubular cells. So, that means it is almost a severe form of cell injury that has happened and it is showing the cloudy change. If the injury is to continue invariably, this is going on to develop kidney necrosis. Hydropic swelling in the liver is seen in this image where you can see the clear vacuolar cytoplasm. So, that is where the fluid has accumulated in the cytoplasm of the cells and the nucleus is seen in the center. So, this is a reversible form of hydropic swelling of the liver. So, the two forms of hydropic swelling you can see is either a vacuolar cytoplasm or a eosinophilic staining. The two terms are cloudy swelling or vacuolar degeneration, both reversible. Looking at fatty change next. The other term for fatty change is steatosis. Here there is abnormal accumulation of triglycerides in the liver or the other cells, the parenchymal cells and vacuolations of the cell occur due to the accumulation of the triglycerides as lipid droplets. So, vacuolation of the cells due to the accumulation of fat. So, the common cause for fatty change is toxins like alcohol. So, alcohol is so common and when we talk of alcohol, we tend to think of the liver and fatty change in the liver due to alcoholism is very, very, very common. The other causes of fatty liver is like in diabetes, malnutrition, obesity, hypoxia and many of these would be causes for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, it is a common problem, but again fatty liver as such is reversible. What are the sites of steatosis? The commonest site as I have been saying and which we all remember and know is the liver. Then again the heart, skeletal muscles also can show fatty change. Now, in the liver what happens? The liver is the main focus or the site where all metabolisms happen. So, in the liver how do we get fatty liver? Basically, excess triglycerides accumulate in the liver due to defects in any of the processes or the events that occur from the time free fatty acid enters into the hepatocyte or into the liver and then it becomes triglyceride, apoproteins get added onto it, forms lipoproteins and then it goes out. If any of these steps are altered, then there is accumulation of triglycerides in the liver. And in alcohol, the main reason for uh, fatty liver is that it affects many of these steps of the uh, triglyceride metabolism. Now, what do you see in fatty liver? In a massive fatty liver, the liver will be enlarged, it will be yellow in color and if you are to touch it, it will be very greasy or slimy and soft. I am sure from the image you will be able to make out which is the normal liver and which is the fatty liver. The fatty liver is pale and large and it is yellow in color. Now, what do we see microscopically when we look at fatty liver? Microscopically, initially we call it as microvesicular fatty change. So, as in the diagram, we can see the small vacuoles of lipids accumulate. And after that, what happens is all these small vacuoles that are there in the hepatocyte, they join together and form a single vacuole in the hepatocyte. 
that is called as macrovesicular. And when a single vacuole fills the hepatocyte, what happens is that it pushes the nucleus to one side. Then again, if all the vacuoles or many vacuoles in different hepatocytes were to fuse together, then you will get a fatty cyst. So, that is a sequence of how fatty liver occurs microvesicular, macrovesicular, where it is the nucleus is pushed to one side, and then fatty cysts. Fatty liver with inflammation again the same picture is seen where you can see the macrovesicular fatty change. You can also see some inflammatory cells. What happens to the heart when you get fatty change? Usually in the heart the, it occurs due to hypoxia and if the intensity of the hypoxia is more what we see is that we see the cardiac fibers normal cardiac fibers alternating with the lipid laden cardiac fibers and that gives a tigered effect what we call as a tigered effect or a tabby cat appearance to the heart muscle and that is because of the hypoxia and fatty change in the heart. Now, I have shown the picture of the hematoxyl and eosin section of fatty change where you are seeing the macrovesicular fatty change which are seen the fat is seen as vacuoles nice rounded white vacuoles. We are not able to say that it is fat because even if it is glycogen or some other product with the fixation that we normally do with formalin whatever is the content in the cell that would be lost. So, if you are to demonstrate that it is fat that is forming or that is there in the vacuole, we will have to do a specialized uh, technique for it and that is like when we look at frozen sections and we stain with special stains like oil red O or sudan 4, then we can demonstrate the fat and we will see it as reddish globules or reddish areas of reddish lakes in the um, in the sections. So, you can make out with the reddish sections you can see microvesicular fatty deposition even macrovesicular and even fatty cysts which you can say are definitely fat because they are stained red with oil red O or sudan 4. Now, to look at pigments what are pigments they are colored substances which accumulate in cells. You can have various forms of pigments they are colored substances and the ones of important importance are the abnormal pigments. We will look at some of them exogenous pigments which are pigments which come from outside the commonest example is carbon or coal dust and endogenously means that they are synthesized within the body itself. We will look at two of them that is lipofusin and hemosiderin. We will look at them in a little bit more detail. So, pigments are colored substances and we will look at lipofusin and hemosiderin. Now, lipofusin is an endogenous pigment. It is an insoluble brown pigment. Actually, it has not much of clinical significance. It is more like a wear and tear pigment. Where do we see it? We see it in the heart and in the liver and it is usually a sign of free radical injury and lipid peroxidation. Lipopro lipofusin what does it contain what does this lipofusin contain it contains lipid polymers of lipid phospholipids and proteins fused together that is how the word we can remember lipids phospholipids and proteins which are fused together. Usually it may be seen as part of aging or in severe malnutrition. In the image you can see this insoluble brown pigment very clearly and you can see them usually they are ar arranged or seen close to the nucleus perinuclear arrangement of cells of the pigment. Now to look at hemosiderin what is hemosiderin? Hemosiderin is a hemoglobin derived golden yellow brown and a granular or a crystalline pigment. It is Hemosiderin is a storage form of iron in the tissues. The other storage form of iron is ferritin. So, hemosiderin is seen in the tissues when there is increase in the iron, whichever are the conditions, increase in the iron causes hemosiderin, where ferritin 
which is also increased would form hemosiderin and we can see the hemosiderin because it is insoluble. So, what are the causes of increased iron? Locally, we can see it in the form of hemorrhages in the tissues. That image shows an ecchymotic patch or a bruise. What are we seeing in it? It is a it is showing sort of a bluish to purplish color, varying colors, play of colors is there. What has happened? There has been blood that has bled into the subcutaneous tissue, which has got released out. The it would have been taken up by the macrophages and the iron would have got released, the heme and the globulin would have got separated, the iron would have been absorbed by the or taken up by the macrophages in that site. So, there that is what happens or how hemocytrin comes in the local tissue. Similarly, we can talk of systemic conditions where there is hemocidrosis that is increase in iron in the body. It can occur with multiple transfusions, it can occur in hemolytic anemias like thalassemia and such other hemoglobinopathies. There are several conditions where you can get hemocidrosis. Hemochromatosis is a severe form of hemo, uh, hemocidrosis which can cause organ damage, it can be uh, primary causes, there can be primary causes or there can be secondary causes of hemochromatosis. In all of them, what is accumulating in the tissues is iron or in the form of hemocytrin. And microscopically, what do you see and where do we see them? We see the hemocytrin in the mononuclear macrophages of the reticular endothelial tissue. Mainly, we see them in the reticular endothelial tissue. Normally, also in the bone marrow, we can see some hemocytrin in the uh, macrophages there. But when they are increased, then we call it as hemocytrosis. It can also be seen in the skin, in the pancreas, endocrine organs, and in the kidneys if there is extensive deposition. In hematoxyl and eosin, they are seen as a golden brown granular pigment. And again, to confirm that it is hemocytrin and not some other pigment, we will need to demonstrate the iron or the hemocytrin by the Prussian blue stain. So, when we stain with the Prussian blue, what happens? The colorless potassium ferrocyanide is converted to potassium ferricyanide and that gives a blue black color or produces a blue black pigment. So, when we look at the tissues which when we stain it with Prussian blue, what we see is wherever there is iron we, or hemocytrin, we see them as the blue black pigment. So, that tells us that hemocytrin is increased. So, that is about hemocytrin. Coming on next to pathological calcification. Normally, we see physiological calcification in various parts of the body as the child grows. Here, we are talking of calcification that occurs in abnormal states. And what is happening here? There is abnormal tissue deposition of calcium ions. And there are basically two types of calcification that is dystrophic calcification and metastatic calcification. Dystrophic calcification. What does the word mean? Dystrophic means disorganized or disoriented or discoordinated. Dystrophic calcification. And what basically it means is that it is localized calcification, it is seen at specific areas. Unlike this, what we see in metastatic calcification is that there is widespread calcification, calcification occurring in various parts of the body. This word metastatic also comes in neoplasia, where in neoplasia what it means is that there is a tumor at one site, a primary site, it goes through one route of spread and then it goes to a distant site and deposits there. So, it spreads to a distant site that is metastasis when we talk of neoplasia. Here we are talking of metastatic calcification which means that there is widespread areas of calcification in the body. Now, the next thing about the calcification is that when we talk of dystrophic calcification, it occurs localized and it occurs in pathological tissue, in tissues affected by disease, while metastatic calcification occurs in normal tissues. And another thing is that in dystrophic calcification, 
the calcium levels are normal while in metastatic calcification there is always hypercalcemia. So, to look at the causes of dystrophic calcification. One area where it can be seen are the heart valves. As shown in the image, you can see an aortic valve there. And what we are seeing in that is that you can see behind the cusp areas of calcification seen as whitish small nodules. All those are areas of calcification in the diseased aortic valve. Other conditions where we can see dystrophic calcification include athromatous plaques that means in the arteries we have an athromatous plaque and at the site of the plaque after some time there can be calcification. In old tubercular scars after the tuberculosis has healed at those sites we can get calcification. Other areas breast lesions like for example in in carcinomas of the breast there can be calcium depositions. So, that is the main focus or that is the main indication for mammography in breast carcinomas or breast lesions. So, that when we do the mammogram we are able to identify these micro calcifications that may be there. So, then another condition where you can see dystrophic calcification is in fat necrosis like we see in pancreatitis. Another important cause or group of conditions where we can get dystrophic calcification is in tumors. So, in tumors spe specifically certain tumors we get what are called as samoma bodies. They are actually circumscribed concentric depositions of, of calcium which form these bodies. We can see samoma bodies in meningiomas that is a typical example where we see samoma bodies. So, samoma body is an example of dystrophic calcification. Other conditions where we can see samoma bodies are papillary carcinomas of the thyroid and papillary ovarian carcinomas. So, all of them are sites where we can see samoma bodies which are an example of dystrophic calcification. Then causes of metastatic calcification, they are seen in various conditions where there is hypercalcemia. So, in various malignancies, in various parathyroid tumors, where in conditions where the parathormone is produced as an ectopic hormone, other causes of primary and secondary parathyroidism are the conditions where there is extensive bone destruction. In all these conditions we can see metastatic calcification. So, when we look at metastatic calcification there is calcium deposits in various parts of the body. So, that is about calcification. So, to summarize we looked at certain intracellular accumulations. We looked at the reversible change of hydropic change where there is water accumulating in the liver or the kidney. Then we looked at fatty change which is due to a derangement in the fat metabolism commonest cause being alcohol where we can see deposition especially in the fat or in the liver of triglycerides in various forms which are demonstrated by the Prussian blue reaction. Sorry not Prussian blue in fatty change what is it that we are going to use to identify the fat we have to do a frozen section and then we have to stain it with oil red o or sudan 4. Where do we do Prussian blue reaction or Prussian blue stain? We do it for hemosiderin. To demonstrate the iron we need to stain it with Prussian blue and we can identify the excess iron in the tissues. Then the other cause of brownish pigment is lipofusin. When we looked at dystrophic and metastatic calcification, we looked at the mechanism, we looked at various conditions and the basic key difference between the two, con two types of calcification. With this, we have given a brief summary of intracellular accumulations. Wish you all the very best. Have a good day. Thank you.